Hello and welcome to this episode of That Show on the Weekend. I'm your host, whatever I am today, and I'm with my friend Steve. <laughs> and we're That's really descriptive. Yes. Now, we're talking about a lot of fun stuff. Mostly in the open source community. So, I'm going to hand it off to my co-host. Well, so the first bit of news is that open source, <coughs> the, I believe it's the... <coughs> the open source organization which open source thing hits 20 is it just the GNU project is 20 now so that would make sense so yeah they're turning 20 yeah so the concept of open source turns 20 <laughs> as of Saturday yes yesterday and we're all very excited because it means that they're stable. Well, kind of. I'm. If you look at how long Microsoft's been around, like people think computers and uh, Windows is a ubiquitous thing, but really, like Windows itself, like the big widespread Windows, is younger than I am. Yeah. It's one of those things that people like Windows ninety eight and ninety five the two most popular early Windows. Like, yeah, Windows 3.11 was a thing, but let's be honest. It was a business thing. Nobody really had that at home. Mm -hmm. But, like, Windows 95 was... What? 23 years ago now? Yeah, probably. I mean, we're in 2018 now, so... Like, we were 95 and 95, you know? Yeah, so... Like, the fact that the open source community has been, you know, <coughs> like, open source existed before that date, but it was, like, solidified with the the writing of the general, of the GNU public license. Mm. In other news, um, Adblock Plus is partnering with uh, Open Source Initiative. Yeah, so this is kind of exciting, because um, early on, Adblock Plus was, like, the best... Uh, ad blocking software until the the guy that did the ad block plus realized that there was no money in it and there was some kind of my understanding is there was a bit of a selling some of that information that they were blocking to advertisers and by open sourcing it they now are like well here's the code we're going to clean it up and make it more transparent which is what the whole reason behind uBlock or, or yeah, uBlock was. Is that it was a more transparent, more open version of AdBlock Plus. So that begs the question, what happens with uBlock? Yeah. Like, do we like, okay, sorry uBlock, this other guy came back and he's better again. So the concept of why we have open source and to promote openness and transparency is important um although transparency well, doesn't always mean honesty well so the whole point behind the open source project or the open source movement <coughs> is the the source code can be freely distributed and modified at will it is free as in free speech not free as in free beer and that's the most important distinction to make while there is generally free and open source software that are both, they don't nef necessarily have to be that. Uh, looking at like Red Hat Linux, for example, you have to pay for that distribution of open source software. And they're okay with that because you're paying for the support and the physical media to install it, but you aren't paying for the source code itself. It's kind of weird. Um, but aside from that, the whole point behind it is if there's something wrong with your computer and you know how to fix it, you should be able to be able to fix it. Yeah. And a lot of it is... So, 
one of the examples of like graphic card manufacturers and open source goes is that AMD was uh, creating open source drivers for their graphic cards themselves and they realized that that was tedious so what they did was when people were like well our stuff isn't working anymore <coughs> AMD is like well here you go here's the code that we use it's yours now we're, we're done and they are and to this day they are still open source drivers made by the community to continue to support the AMD cards and to an extent they are far more stable than the closed source drivers um, on the other hand NVIDIA still has Linux drivers but they maintain them themselves there are open source drivers that are not maintained or endorsed by NVIDIA that do offer some performance in the OpenGL programs over the NVIDIA but if you want to Linux game, you use the NVIDIA drivers because that's what you do. Um, the AMD drivers themselves aren't super duper stable. So while there has been success in gaming on an AMD graphics card with Linux, the, the conventional wisdom is go with NVIDIA because they support their shit. Yeah, and speaking of open source last september um microsoft uh, became a sponsor of open a source a platinum member of the open source community they spent lots of money for that title yeah and it's kind of so when the previous president of microsoft stepped down and the new guy came in whose names well, both of their names i keep forgetting um, one of the things he realized is that Microsoft, <clears throat> while it is a strong product and it is competitive because everybody has it still, it is not the best product out there. Mm. So if you look at the, um, the cloud software that Microsoft is currently running, it's all Linux based. Like the Azure, the, all of their cloud stuff is <coughs> Linux based. And then they've over the past few years, they've been integrating more Linux subsystems into Microsoft uh, products. Like, for example, you can install uh, command line Ubuntu in Windows 10 and run Bash through command prompt or uh, PowerShell, which is probably the thing more people use because it's better. Now, the insidious thing that people kept saying that you know, trying to accuse Microsoft of at that time was uh, they were trying to break into the open source community and then try to copyright stuff and then take ever more away and bring it into their ecosystem. Right. So while that can be, the the problem is a lot of the open source licensings and have are built in a way that they are copywritten so that they can't be copywritten. <clears throat> It's all under the, the concept of copyleft, where you copyright this thing so other people can't down the road copyright it. Mm -hmm. And you then release it under the GNU general public license to be like, okay, so this is copywritten, uh, you can use it freely, everybody can enjoy this, but you can't then copyright it later if you modify the code. And some people have injected their code into an open source project turned around, closed the whole uh, project after a fork and said, well, this is our version of it now, and then have sued to change the name of the original project that they took the code from. Um, there was an open source uh, shooter that we, that was like a Quake clone that I used back in college called Nexus. And the people that made it wanted to a version of it on the Xbox 360. So they forked the project, closed that source code, turned it all into C Sharp so that they could put it on the Xbox 360, and then told the people that from the original project that they had to change their name mm. so that people weren't confusing their product with the original product. And they complied <laughs> because a lot of it was the members from that original project anyway. So it's one of those things, like, yeah, that's something that can happen. Um, but, for example, if Microsoft went into, like, the, the GNOME desktop, and they're like, we're going to turn this into the new Microsoft desktop, 
they can't then go, okay, Gnome Project, sorry, we own this now. Since the, the Gnome Project has been established and the copy left is in place for that project. Even if the copy left wasn't in place, and the, like, no, just everyone thought it was, but it wasn't, wouldn't it be very hard for Microsoft to do that anyway? Cause this, right. Because after a while, when you know someone made something, everyone knows you're a liar if you try to say something, you know. Well, yes and no. So there are certain uh, legal gray areas that somebody has had this thing out in the public, but they have not laid proper claim to it somebody then can come through and pick that up and say it's mine. And that's happened a few times. Um, hmm. it, it's kind of this, again, weird gray area. Um, like the original DOS was bought for $50 from somebody else. They cleaned it up and called it DOS. And they own the copyright to the thing that they bought for $50. Right. And the guy couldn't then go, well, that that's all my project. Or that's my product. I owe you owe me more than this kind of thing. Yeah. There was this game article on open source. Keep going. Somebody recently open sourced this old game. Great Cave Adventure. That's what it was. God, they're just all about this this time, aren't they? Colossal Cave Adventure, but opensource.com had an article about it. Just do what you were going to do, Dan. So the the one thing about the so the Colossal Cave Adventure has just open sourced um, an uh, an official port, and it's this kind of interesting concept. So uh, there was this game way back in 1976 <coughs> called Colossal Cave Adventure. It was the very first uh, text parser adventure game. The like oh you're in this cave, there's a waterfall over here, there's a path over there, and then you type in like, look at water or whatever. This was the first one. So it's kind of an important game from a historic standpoint. It is not like an amazing game, but it is important. Like, Haosu isn't an amazing film, but it's in the Centurion Collection because of its importance in film. So, uh, Colossal Cave Adventure, uh, the original project was written way back in the day in Fortran. So, Fortran doesn't run well on modern machines, because it was originally written in punch card. Mm. Like, the person has a stack of punch cards that they kept to be like, this is my copyright claim to this game, is I have the code in card. It's very hard to argue with that. Like, so, um, there's been a few ports of it over the years, and there was an open source port of it created by fans to bring it over into Linux. However, the, the original creators of Colossal Cave Adventure and the guy that made the POP3 Mel uh, protocol right. was like, I'm bored, let's make an official port. So he took all the original code, ran it through uh, a program that changes Fortran code into C++ code, and then was like, okay, here's this hot mess that I just made. Let's all collectively clean this up. So the interesting part of that project is, like, you get to work with people that have been working on computers since the 70s, <clears throat> which is really interesting, because not a lot of people have that opportunity to work with people that have been working on it for almost their entire lives mm. and worked on things that are so ubiquitous with modern computing like POP3. 
Um, yeah, but SMTP is... Sort of... Oh, it's better, but POP3 still used, yeah. and it was, like, very important because it works with dial-up. You connect, it pushes through, and then you can disconnect. And that was the original ver uh, reason for the POP. Um, so the other thing is it helps people that are learning how to code how to fix code, which is an important skill to have. You, you should always write code properly so that you can always go back and fix it. And a lot of people are really content in forgetting to put comments in their own code. Um, the philosophy of code like the next person that is going to work on your code knows where you live and wants to murder you if you fuck up. <laughs> so, lots of, of fixing things, lots of commenting... And it's a great project to go in and be like, this is a hot mess, let's fix it, and learn how to avoid these mistakes in the future. Right. So, it's this really interesting project that is still going on, and they've gotten a lot of volunteers, but there's still a lot of work to do. So, it's one of those things that if you know how to code in these languages and you want to fix things and learn how to fix things better, go for it. Yeah. yeah that's interesting. Because it's another one of those things that, as technology progresses forwards, you'll run into an issue... You're in my face. Oh, sorry. You run into an issue that old games don't run on new hardware. And so the only way to play these games, like Colossal Cave Adventure, is to fix the code and make it run on a modern computer. But then you have to... Uh, also have somebody else go through it for integrity of the game. Because some people be, might be like, well, that puzzle was really fucking dumb. I'm going to fix it to make it make sense. But at that point, you run into the dilemma of, if I fix it now, it's not how it was. The game is now a different game than the original game. So do you uh, preserve the dumb puzzle... Or fix it. Or you could fork it. You could fork it, but then that's a different game. Right. But you still have the original, at least. Right. So you get the best of both worlds. For the hardcore people, you have the original dumb thing. For the new people, you have the new hot thing. Right. So, like, the biggest example of, like, people fixing that kind of thing is in the original King's Quest. <clears throat> There was a puzzle that was very obtuse. There was a Rumpelstiltskin character, and you had to put it in his name backwards. Now, it would be very easy to just type in Rumpelstiltskin, but in backwards. There was uh, another step so that that wasn't actually the solution. So when they released it on uh, a further release on a more uh, robust engine, they fixed it so that that was the actual solution. Mm. It was one of those things that you had to put the, the name down, find its numbers, and then put it backwards by alphabetical numeric. Yeah. So, like, G's a w whatever letter it is, and then you had to rearrange them to be numerically in order, and then reverse that. So it was this huge goddamn production. You know, speaking of dumb puzzles, I've been playing the new Mass Effect Andromeda, and literally one of the puzzles in the game is a Sudoku puzzle. That's just great. All the time. Just, there's this thing that you have to do on just about every world you visit. It's a Sudoku puzzle with, obviously, alien text or whatever. And it's Sudoku-like. Sudoku. It's but Sudoku. It's Sudoku. And it's stupid AF. Well, so there's... I mean, it's a great game, Sudoku. It challenges the mind, but when you have to do it over and over again. Well, there was the... So the head of the Sudoku Society in Japan, who's also a coder, wrote a program that you can put in any Sudoku puzzle and it will solve it for you. Or you could look up the internet. Yeah, you can always look it up, but... It's one of those things that if I can teach something to do it for me, why do it? Yeah, I was thinking, you know, wouldn't it be cool just to have an app you take a picture of the puzzle and it calculates it for you? That'd be interesting. Mm. That's very complicated. 
a challenge perhaps set forth to the community anyway Microsoft ditches Windows 10 S in favor of S mode so think of like Windows XP mode except worse because you know S mode is like only the Windows App Store no no like X EXEs anymore really it's the Windows app thing they're like trying to get rid of the Win32 um, schema and push their own store so in other words Windows S mode turns it into Microsoft store only stuff yeah kind of like Windows Chrome OS I mean, yeah, well, <laughs> no, that, that's fine. I get it. Windows Chrome OS. Sorry, you can only install things through the, the Windows Store or the Chrome browser. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Oh my god, that would be perfect. I think that should be their April Fool's joke. But um, I guess this is targeted towards schools and stuff where they don't want their kids having fun. Well, yeah and no. Like, have you been to the Windows Store? Not really. I mean, I've opened it out of curiosity. So there are certain things that people use that aren't in the Windows Store. And by locking down things so you can't use things other than from the Windows Store is a terrible idea. Yeah. Like, you'd have to buy the Office 360. That's it. That's your only option. That's the only thing in there. And I don't know why they think it's a good idea. I mean, it, you know, they should have just forked their company and said, here's an alternate product, but we're well, still going to support the original. So, like, the whole point behind Windows 10 is they wanted to make a Windows that runs on everything. They tried that with 8, and they didn't really succeed with 8. So they're like, 10, 10's when we're going to do that. Mm. Our, our grand project of... Here's the Windows, you can install it on anything. Here's the version for this processor, this processor, this processor. Whatever it's installed on, it's the same Windows. And they've kind of done that. Like, the ARM version of Windows 10 is not really Windows 10. But it's okay. It works. I believe it is S-mode. Hmm. But a 32-bit and 64-bit <laughs> Windows 10 work perfectly fine. They're one of the few people that are like, eh, sure, 32-bit, we'll still support that. A lot of other higher-end operating systems were like, eh, guys, really, just upgrade your things now. Yeah, if you, if, I mean, 4 gigs of RAM is great for surfing the web, but if you want to do anything more... It's functional for a decent amount of things. It's, it's not the, the <coughs> RAM requirement, really, that gets into it. It's the 32-bit of the 32-bit processor. Yeah. Uh, they s made those up to a certain amount of cores before they're like, okay, everything's 64-bit now. Though I've heard debate about whether you can go past 64-bit to 128 because there is increasing overhead as you go up. And the a factor of two. Right, so so far, going to 120-bit processing might be slower than 64-bit. Well, it's another one of those things that if technology does that make that leap, we're still not caught up yet. We have like 32 core processors and most operating systems ignore after like 8. Right. Most programs ignore after 2. So, like the 64-bit version, the 64-bit on the 64-bit processor everything still hasn't gotten over to that point yet either. Because they're like, if we write 32-bit, everybody can run it. But if we make 64-bit, only these people can run it. Which is now like 70% of the population. Right. Well, Chrome stopped supporting 32-bit a while ago. Right. And good on them. That was uh, an interesting move, and they haven't really gotten any backlash from that. Right. Because I think it still just installs the old version for people on 32 no, it, uh, if you try to install a 32-bit pro... Uh, no, the old version. When you go to the website, it does the last supported release for 32. The last time I tried to do it, they were like, there is no version for your operating system. Oh, Sorry. Okay. Maybe. 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 The, well, 
I haven't, I haven't checked in a while because I haven't had access to a 32-bit system. and So I have this old laptop that I love to take everywhere. And it's still 32-bit. It's my old college laptop from 2006. Mm. It <clears> runs... <throat> it has run every version of Windows from XP to 10. <laughs> and several different versions of Linux. It has been the de the laptop that I wipe and install new things on for over a decade now. You know, um, if the tech community really wanted to push 64, Windows 10 should not have had a 32-bit release. That's an interesting thought. The problem is Windows is... Itself has 32-bit applications. Well, no. Well, yeah, that. But <laughs> the other thing with Windows is the reason they have such a tremendously large market share yeah. is that they super-duper believe in trying to support everything. Like, all of the things. 16-bit support ended when Vista came out. So, take that in. Like, right. when they had to end 16-bit support when they released their first 30 or 64-bit operating system. Because they're like, the 64-bit operating system can't support 16-bit programs. We've got to drop those or upgrade them. Right. So, uh, by the way, that was what I was super excited for. So, when I, I had a laptop, then I upgraded to the new laptop because I was excited for Windows Vista back in the day. I thought it was pretty cool, too. It was not great. No. It, it was one of those things where the system requirements, the minimum system requirements and what it actually needed were not the same number. <laughs> you only need a gig of RAM. No, you really need, like, two to start, one when it's up and running. Yeah, but Vista was... So Vista started the new... The next gen GUI look, yeah. The everything's glossy, and it also started the um, the large resource requirements that we see today. So, before Vista, XP, you know, how much space did XP need? Well, so the 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 differentiating the new architecture for sure. The the line in the sand was operating systems used to run on. XP and older used to run under the whole philosophy of operating systems are not really meant to be seen, but they do all of the work. Right. When Vista came out, they're like, okay, what if we make the operating system fancy? D. So people are like, oh, look how it looks. Look at all these things that it comes with. And they really, really drove home the, the looks and the package software. So Windows XP could install on, like, a half-gig thumb drive with no problem. Vista can't. 7 can't. 8 and 10 can't. Like, they can put their installer on an 8-gig thumb drive, but it when you go to install it, you realize it's now expanded to 20 gigs. Right. And a lot of that is stuff that you will never use that they install because like all of the stuff that it comes with yeah and Windows 10 is kind of bad with that um, oh after Vista and up it's been more and more and more like Candy Crush Saga now gets installed right you don't need Candy Crush Saga I go through the PowerShell just removing well so those applications don't really take that much room because they have the the Windows application, like the, the Windows Store application things, have an underrunning architecture that they run on top of. And that's always installed and always running. So then they just snap different applications into the big... It's more like a, a console cartridge kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but then they have all the original Windows things that they're still supporting. and all. So Edge, the reason <coughs> Edge runs fast on Windows is that it slots into the, the Windows architecture as a snap. And so it's fast because most of the stuff that it needs to run has started up with your system. Mm. It's the fast boot. So it runs fast because they cheat. Uh, Firefox 
runs the same on every system because they don't preload anything. Well, Firefox did the thing, the quantum is right, now where it, load, the quantum. where it loads the web page um, the meaningful content first and then the ads last right. rather than the ads. So instead of loading everything at the same time, it loads in phases. And yeah. it runs really well. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it is the most meaningful update to Firefox since they introduced the 64-bit version of Firefox. What do you think um, the viability of Windows... How f Well, I should say it like this. How far does Windows have to degrade its experience before alternate operating systems really have a chance to gain what would be considered a, a reasonable market advancement. Well, so Microsoft has stated Windows 10 is the last Windows. Well, they say that. But does right. anyone really believe them? Well, so... I mean, it just... if you look at how their, their Microsoft Store works, it's very clear that they set it up to be... They looked at how Apple does it. Yeah. I was about to say very apple -inian. Right. So, Mac OS... 10 has been running strong for a very long time. And they release service packs. Right. As uh, addition upgrades. So there's like 10, 10.1, 10.2, 10.3. And Microsoft's like, we could do that. And then we'll charge like, like Apple does. Just so good. You know, I was thinking, what if, and this is a stupid idea, well, maybe, but what if uh, there were two options? One, the free version, well, you, you pay for the initial install of Windows, and then, of course, they mine your information, um, you know, for the service updates, but the alternate is that you could just pay a subscription fee with without well, to have not have any so of your data or they ads. Kind, or they have been moving a lot of stuff over to subscription. They saw what Adobe did, and they're like, Adobe is making fistfuls of cash now. Because, one, their software is near impossible to pirate now. Because you have to log in to use the software. I'm sure there are workarounds. I have not looked into it. That's not my jam. I'm, I'm a gimp guy. This show does not endorse the use of piracy in any way. Buy your stuff. Okay, continue. Or use an open source alternative and not yes. have to worry about it. I use Sorry, Gimp. WinRAR. I use, I use Seven Zip. I'm tired of hitting the. Yeah, yeah. I'll 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 pay for it. Just, just let me keep going. Uh, <laughs> it's so sad. There's a funny story about that. But I use Gimp as well. But I use the video. I don't use Photoshop because I have Gimp. Obviously, Gimp. Too. Right. But um, the there's been talk about open source alternatives to Premiere or Final Cut, um, and they're getting better. You know, I mean, it's hit from the, Express. So when you look at open source project alternatives the the main driving force is usually there's a shift <coughs> in how the main product everybody uses has been changed once the subscription based pay as you go kind of thing that adobe did happened a lot of the open source alternatives to all these other products really started stepping up and really just crazy working on their projects so there are a lot of really good open source video editors now mm -hmm. where two years ago there wasn't there was a few but not as good so as a an individual like paying 25 dollars a month to use photoshop is seems ridiculous to me well it's double-edged because some people are like well because if you don't pay it you don't get access to the program anymore right they shut you off and if that is your livelihood that is kind of dangerous to do right at the same time uh people who used who who was hit the wall of adobe or whatever it's like it's like a thousand dollars or for the whole suite and you don't get anything past security updates or whatever might be like hey now i only have to pay 25 a month yeah they're in the long term, they're making a lot off of me. But from my point of view, I'm paying only 25 unlimited updates and 
Right, so, so the other yeah. thing to look at is the CS updates. So CS6 was the last uh, Adobe suite under the old licensing scheme. If you have CS6, you still have CS6. They can never take that away from right. you. They cannot push you into the CC. And that's kind of the, the... The Creative Suite licensing was good for the consumer. The Creative Cloud licensing is good for Adobe. And you have to recognize that is the distinction between right. those two. But then you look at how Microsoft decided to do some of their stuff. So Office 365 is that. It is a subscription-based office. I still have Microsoft Office 2010 Professional Plus. Right. And LibreOffice is a solid open source contender. That's true. And LibreOffice, when it first launched, had more compatibility with the Microsoft Doc X formatting than the previous versions of Microsoft Office did. So like 2003 to 2006 or seven, when they introduced Doc X, everything older than that one had a hard time opening the new Office. But LibreOffice and OpenOffice were like, we can totally open these. What's the problem, Microsoft? Shouldn't your stuff work with your stuff better than ours? Mm. And, you know, it is what it is. Right. And this whole shift of <clears throat> subscription-based, and I can see them doing that with Windows, but then at that point it is the most dangerous of the games. If I don't pay my subscription, I can't log into my computer. And that would be... A and that is the death knell. Yeah. I feel... If they did that, that is how people look for other operating systems. Well, here's what happens. If you stop paying, um, it just switches over to starting to collect data again and serving you ads every once in a while. Well, so the thing is... I mean, I'd hate that. Don't have to right. do that. But. Well, they collect your data anyway. Well, You've I mean, already paid for the product. Yeah, the, the thing they could do is they could do the um, Adobe Kindle route. Or the, not the Adobe, the Amazon Kindle route. Um, the Kindle has a cheap version that gives you advertisements, mm. or you can pay the full price and not get ads. And that's how they sell their product cheaper. You willingly say, like, yeah, okay, sure, constantly show me ads. I'm okay with that if it makes this product half the price. Right. Now, the other side of subscription based is if the company that you're paying for whatever service has maybe quarterly feature updates or you know it also comes with better support and um, just overall a better experience so because of that my thoughts on a product is that when you buy the product it has a lifespan. I should get updates until you decide that little product is dead. By forcing that behind a subscription and going, well, there's never an end to the life cycle of this product, you... So it used to be, I release the new version of this product, the old product's support ends in two years after this product is released, and you force people to upgrade, and that's how you continue to make money. This whole content behind subscriptions like it's very interesting because this same dilemma happened in video games with DLC mm -hmm. I release a game and then if you want the rest of the game you pay extra money for that and then there was microtransactions <coughs> and all these other things and pe uh, companies were like how do we make a product even more profitable than it already is you, oh, right, you make them keep giving you money for the product that they paid for. Right. And while there is no, like, initial cost to the Adobe Creative Cloud, but the fact that you keep giving them money forever or you lose access to it is kind of ransom, in a way? Yeah. So what about a happy middle ground of, like, you buy a product, the in your per you get it forever, you, you don't have to pay anything if you don't want to ever again. It's supported two, three, or five years out into the future with updates. But after that five-year mark, um, continued support, like uh, call-in support and so forth, um, 
is is like a is is a yearly or whatever. So here's the thing with like because after oh, a while, but we're gonna sell you the support for the product. That is so the whole you pay a fee, you get the product, and then you can pay extra for the actual like over the phone support is the Red Hat uh, model. Right. You pay money for a Red Hat license. You now have Red Hat forever, and it updates forever. But if you want us to help you support that, you pay us an extra amount of subscription fee. The reason companies don't do that, and the thing like Red Hat ran into problems early on, is people find out how to support their own stuff. Mm. Like, oh, if I can save $200 a month by just having this kid over here read a couple of books, I'll do that. I'm paying him anyway. So having people pay for support is kind of a silly notion, and companies realize that way early in the mid-90s. Right. Like, the platinum-level, like, Microsoft server support is kind of worth it if you're, like, a huge multi-million dollar corporation, but if I'm it's just me and my Windows 10 machine at home, I'm not going to pay you $30 a month for the opportunity to ask you for help. Right. Because if you Google a problem, people have found this problem, and here's their solutions <coughs> to that problem. So you could charge for a support forum, but then people make other forums. The, the problem with a lot of that is the internet is a thing. Mm-hmm. And because the internet's a thing and people can talk to one another, you cannot monopolize support on a product. Which is why they realize subscription fees, that's where we can do it. Now, I know I've been playing the counter-argument, and I've been doing that on purpose. Now, but I just wanted to bring up the cell phone yearly release model. It's yep. to the point, so, and since cell phones have matured to the point when this, this Note 5... Is perfectly fine in every way, and I have, and I've now paid it off. It's mine. Um, I just have to pay Verizon for the connection, but it's fine. It doesn't need to be upgraded. But yet, companies still need to make money. So, there's two examples of where this idea comes from: car models. There are people out there that need a new car for the new car model on an annual or biannual basis. Well, like truck drivers, they drive them so much that they only last right. two years. There are, there are the people that drive a car till it falls apart, then gets a new car. The people that buy cell phones with the same mentality will also do that. The target audience for annual cell phone model updates are the people that are the Apple cultists, right. as I refer to them. That, oh, the new iPhone came out, I need to get that one. And there's usually a, an upgrade deal every time. And so they keep getting your money, and you keep getting a new phone, and then you just keep going forever. And that's a very wasteful, like, electronic consumer waste is a huge problem mm. because of things like that. So, but the whole, the new thing came out, and forcing people into the new thing was the old software model. So they kind of like pick and choose their favorites between the car model dilemma and the software <laughs> upgrade dilemma. And they're like, okay, so some people do the use the phone till the phone explodes. That's fine. We'll make it so phones explode faster. You know, looking at the galaxies and <laughs> catching on fire, literally exploding faster right. for you. Now, at what point, like for me... Do you think it's fair that Samson would should ever stop supporting the Note Five? And eventually, yes, they should. I mean, how, it just well, depends. When is that time? When is a reasonable? So, as far as supporting hardware like that goes, you look at the whole how people supported computers and hardware there. Like your 980 Ti is still fine. Right. You don't need a 1080 Ti. Right. It's along the same lines, like, you use your phone until you feel like I can't run, like, Pokemon Go or whatever, so I bought a new phone so that I can do that now. And I didn't buy the most up-to-date phone either, so my phone will be old again sooner than if I bought the up-to-date phone at the time that I upgraded my mm -hmm. phone. So, there's a lot of that. Like, I bought a new processor for my computer, I'll buy the 
last year's best model at a cheaper price than this year's best model, and I'll have to upgrade again sooner than if I did that <laughs> by a year. You might want to wait to the new architectures that had the hardware fix and silicon for Spectre. Yeah, whenever that happens. Yeah. Um, but no, my um, F my um, computer, my FX eighty three fifty. I just I was going to upgrade it for Adobe rendering, and then I realized for five hundred dollars I could build with a Xeon server with eight cores, sixteen threads, thirty two gigs of EEC memory. Um, and the, and the nine, was it three hundred or it was really cheap, uh, just eBay parts all the way, and the, with a nine, a seven fifty Ti for the CUDA rendering, and then all of a sudden I don't have the problem of long render times on my workstation, and thus just extended the life of this CPU right. by another, at least for my purposes. So as far as how long should the phone manufacturer support the phone, um, look at how. NVIDIA does their graphics card support versus AMD's graphics card support. I mean, get drivers way back for NVIDIA. Right. Like, They're still supporting, like, 330 models on NVIDIA. I have, a, like, a 480 right there. Because the way they write like their 40, drivers 60. is they're like, okay, every... We don't write drivers for specific cards. We write, we write drivers for architectures. Right. So, like, this is the one that uses Kepler. Here's the Kepler architecture drivers. And that way you can support cards more interestingly and more efficiently. Like, everything that uses this architecture uses this driver. We do the updates for this. Where, like, the older graphics cards, like, okay, there's the architecture that one used. It's still kind of supported, so here's updates for this driver. Like, I installed <laughs> up-to-date drivers on a, like, 2006 NVIDIA pro computer the other day. There were updates for it. That's insane. <clears throat> right. Because it used uh, an architecture that was like ended four years ago. So there were still production models that... I think it, it had a same architecture as 660s or something like that. Yeah, so anyway. the Because of the way they do it, it's great. <coughs> ATI which then became AMD mm -hmm. when AMD bought them out, has had the worst supports. My fancy laptop that I got in 2006 has a 1300 Mobility Radeon ATI graphics card. I remember those. Right. They stopped supporting those two years after I got that laptop. <laughs> so... At that point, they took all of the drivers up to a certain point and were like, okay, these are legacy now. We're not updating them after this point. And then Windows 7 came out. So I didn't have Windows 7 drivers. Do I you, used the Vista drivers. Do you think that's a inter like lack of money or, and resources to do that? or on their side? It's kind of to force you to get new hardware. Because they have because lack of money. Because we stopped supporting it. Right. Like, look at Microsoft and when they cancelled XP. Like, okay guys, seriously, we're done supporting XP. And then the Navy and paid see... them a lot of money to continue to support. Right, so then you look at how that affected consumers. Like, Windows XP went from the lion's share of the market to Windows 7 is now the lion's share of the market. Right. Because everybody's like, well... Seven runs on XP machines, so... Done. But, in order to force people to upgrade, you have to eventually cancel or give them a reason to upgrade. Right. So, with your phone, like, yeah, they can support it, it'll still work. But, phone manufacturers are notoriously bad at updating their software. Like, the individual apps are updated by whoever you apps through, and that's fine. But the actual hardware of the phones... Like, the actual version of Android on your phone. Mm -hmm. uh, they're really bad at updating that. <clears throat> like, oh, the new version of Android came out, but your phone isn't going to get it because we've got all these hundreds and hundreds of versions of phones. We can't possibly support all of them. Yeah, but I think their flagship phones should at least 
good. Like, I guess this, this, the Note 5 started on Lollipop and then went to Marshmallow and is now Nougat. Or is it Nougat? And then Oreo is the new one. But there's no reason why this couldn't run the newest Oreo. Right, and there isn't, but... I mean, it's like... Powerful. But since your phone has been released, how many versions of the Note have come out? Well, six, seven, I guess, and eight. Right. Kind of. So, we don't really count seven, I guess, right? Because that just... Right, so the thing is, like, lots of versions of your phone have come out since you bought your phone. Yeah, I just don't like And lots of the out. other versions of the flagship phones have come out. Right. So, like, the Galaxy comes out and as an individual for every major phone company in the U.S., like, since, like, the original Galaxy S. Like, oh, there's the Galaxy S for Samsung. Or, not, for Sprint. Or Motorola. Not Motorola. I'm really bad at phone people because I don't use them. Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, yeah. and T-Mobile. There we go. We got there. So, that's four versions of the phone. Mm -hmm. Then, when they release the second version of the phone, they didn't do the Galaxy 2 uh, across the board because they skipped right to 3. Right. And then there's the 4, the 5, the 6. And the seven's the most recent one? The Galaxy Note 8? Okay, so there's an 8 now. So, that's 8 times 4 phones you have to support now. And that's just your flagship phone. Right. So, yeah, but really, what's the difference between the 7... Eight? You know, the, the architecturally... Well, so, again, in order to force people to update, you have to eventually be like, okay, we can't support these phones anymore because it's <clears throat> literally too many phones. Now. Yeah, but how hard... I, I, I don't think... I mean, it, like, Windows is can be installed on just about anything. Yeah, cause it has same thing with Android. Exactly. So, part of that is eventually you hit the wall where the phone company doesn't support it anymore, so you go and Synergen mod your phone. Sure. You go and you find, okay, my phone's not under warranty anymore, I'm just going to root it and put a custom firmware on there. Right. And that's how you continue to expand the life of your phone. Yeah. But the, the problem with phones, and is the same problem with laptops is once they are made, it is very hard to update any of that hardware. It is a single unit package. Mm -hmm. So, like with laptops, most of the time the only things you can replace in it are hard drives and RAM. And that's it. You can't change any of the other stuff on it because it's usually special manufactured for the, the form factor of the right. laptop. Well, it's weird. Like it's the, the PCBs have like weird circles and cutouts and shapes. Right. It's the same thing with the phones. Once the phone's made, there's no way to physically update the hardware. Right. As Samson found out with the Note 7. Right. So you can chain, or you can swap out SIM cards and you can swap out micro SD cards and sometimes you can swap ba batteries, but a lot of manufacturers are preventing you from doing that as well. So eventually your phone you'll have to upgrade your phone because the battery and it's bad and you can't replace just the battery. Well, I've had, had a problem where, like, sometimes it would, like, say there's no SIM card, and then we detect it and say so you have to reboot. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. Man. It's That's a failing. loose connection, and you can't just fix a loose connection. You have to get the whole new phone. Right. It's like, oh, look, the... The, the rear view mirror came off my car. I have to throw the whole thing out and buy a new car. Well, that's a bit extreme. Yeah, well... <laughs> It is a bit extreme, but it's the whole my SIM card slots loose and doesn't read my SIM card all the time. I can't just replace that. I have to replace the whole thing. Unlike cars. Unlike cars, yes. Not like cars. Unlike cars, yes. Then I see one of those weird cars you don't want Unless understand. you got a Tesla. Then you're like, why, <laughs> well, why no, did I do that? No, you just get a software update and the problem is fixed. You get a software update, and then you realize you have to hold the steering wheel every two minutes or so. Otherwise, the car pulls itself over to the side of the road. You know, that would be a great way to make sure people stay paying attention. Well, that's the whole point behind it, is there was an update to the Tesla, 
and you now have to hold the steering wheel even if it's in self-driving mode uh, periodically otherwise it starts yelling at you and then after a certain amount of time it self-drives itself to the side of the road and pulls over now okay so having your hardware get f updates like like things that don't normally like your car gets an update or your fridge gets an update and for whatever reason it helps reduce frost build up whatever but what if most of the smart fridge things isn't for that no i know but i'm just i'm bring, i'm coming around to the point what if we get up to the point where 3d printers and circuit makers are so good that we can order a product online and it sends it to the printer and prints you the product well there were several people that set up that service that very exact service does exist already for 3D printers. It's not great because 3D printers aren't there, but they ran into the issue of like one person finding a neat model and then releasing it without realizing that 700 other people released the same thing. Mm. So, that, that's kind of the issue with those. But what if like we get to the point where in the 3D printer, right, you can buy just a bunch of circuit boards, just silicon material. And you want a new GPU, right? And that's... I'm sure they'll find some way to DRM the hell out of it. But you oh, could there's, literally... there's a whole bunch of other things for that, but yeah. Go you'd on. literally... Go, you pay NVIDIA money, and it probably... You probably have to log in to the printer with the NVIDIA account or whatever. And it literally prints you... After you pay the $700 or whatever, it literally prints you the new GPU after it confirms you have all the natural resources, which... You know that is that is very in the future sci-fi. Yeah, but like that, there's a whole lot more involved in these processes. <laughs> like, there's a reason the <laughs> DIY graphics card and microchip community doesn't exist. Yeah, no one has like the, a global foundry competitor. Well, not only that, but like, and, uh, processor manufacturing requires uh, a vacuum and detergents right. so that there aren't any fingerprints in the way because even a fingerprint is too much and can ruin some of these like tremendously multi-cored processors. No, yeah, I suppose. But I could just see a time when, when you know... That kind of thing would have worked back in the early 90s and 80s when uh, computers were all hobbyist. Like, that was the Wild West of computing. Right. Back when form factors weren't even solidified. So that could have worked back in the day, but now at this point, everybody's very form factory. And well, well, what I do see it for is great for like things like fixing little bits of plastic on dishwashers and and yeah. other um, stuff for now. But rapid prototyping, right. rapid because it's like twelve hours. Well, you know the space station. The, the, if they didn't already, they put a they did put a three D printer in the space station, and it's like and then they. So the first thing they printed off of that was uh, cups to drink coffee out of that were special designed so that you could drink out of them like a normal cup, but in zero gravity. Well, I mean, 3D printers are our version of, like, Star Trek's um, replicators, at no, least. The, not even close. It's Because the replicator could do a lot more than just make burning plastic smell <laughs> and make a kind of okay-looking miniature of a dog. Hey, but do you think we'll eventually get there? Eventually, sure. But at this point, we're we've got other problems, and three D printers. They're not the end all be all. If right. they if they were very very good, more people would have them. Well, they have concrete printers, and they're using the industrial. They're using it to build like these houses that you can just pop up. Right. Places they are you. really good in the uh, manufacturing industries and like heavy industrial industries, but like home 3D printers are not good enough to the point where people have them en masse. Yeah. I don't know anyone that actually has one. Now, speaking of using technology in other ways, um, did you, you, know, you remember the face swap Thing that someone put it, uh, put on Reddit or whatever, um, that you know, and they've been using it for like porn actors and just replacing people's faces in videos. No. 
Oh, well, th this did exist. This does exist, and many of you might know about it. But they recently did it to uh, Carrie Fisher in, in the last... In the, oh, I, I did see that. That was really but in unsettling. It, well, not the younger Carrie yeah, Fisher. Yeah, I, if, I, but I they, saw that. But they took it for the actual movie, not for porn purposes, but, but the, yeah, actual they put movie. the actual movie. And, and it, it was, was very uncanny valley. And it, but it, no, the one they did was better than the one in the movies. Oh, the industrial okay. light and magic, because the one in the movie, her face was like too pudgy and stuff. But because this literally copies from a video hmm. and implants it onto a new video, it's not like it's rendering it differently. It's hmm. the original performance, but it looked much better. Hmm. That's interesting. Which, I wonder how they they made her face look more pudgy. Because I kept thinking, you know, her face is more concave. the than... actor probably had to wear one of those green screen hoods. Yeah, but you think... And that just... kind of messes with the proportions of your face because it presses into it. They couldn't find a properly proportioned individual. Oh, they did. But again, when you're wearing uh, a spandex hood, it oh. squishes on your face. And if it squishes in the wrong places, it makes your face look pudgier. Yeah, but you'd imagine a pr people like Industrial Light and Magic, who was the... Look, they tried. Yeah. And you have to remember, as far as like these weird technologies go, porn is the wild west of facial recognition. Well, did and... they give us Wi-Fi and all that stuff? No, not Wi-Fi. What, what, the internet? or like Porn no. gave us a lot of technology, though. Uh, porn did a lot of things for the film industry. Like, as in general. Like, photoshopping started off in pornography. And then magazine people were like, oh, we could use that in not porn. Because I knew the porn industry was like multi-billion dollar industries. So yeah, like, like face tracking and stuff like that. Just a lot of... Autofocusing were heavily used there, and then they went on to the main... Uh, yeah. So they... Because they're not high-budget manufacturers they can do all of these interesting things and try all these different techniques and different softwares and different hardwares without fear that if it flops, they won't make their money back. Because you can put, like, $500 into a porno, make a porno, and come back with $20,000. Really? Oh, yeah. It's one of those crazy things that you don't have to put in a lot of effort to get a lot of money back. I could do that. Literally, that's what people do. I just need to get the documents, you know, the, the ones that say I consent and that I can show No, you don't demand. even need that. Like, literally people have the, for OnlyFans accounts. Like, there are websites built on the amateur porn. Right. Like, you can literally put in $5 and get back $300. I know people. Anyway, okay, so, um... Dell says that, moving on, Dell says that it will explore IPO or merger with VMware. So, Dell already in the um, supporting virtual machines and everything, thinking of merging with VMware. But, you know, um, I'm pretty sure Dell owns a large piece of V. So, okay, so VMware VM is the is, open source one, right? Yeah, but VM isn't public and Dell is. And to get around... Or is it Dell that's not... One of them is... Well, VMware is released by Oracle. Yeah, Dell is the largest right? private... Dell is private. VMware is public. So, in order for Dell to have a piece of VMware without having to go public themselves, um, they're thinking about merging with them in some way at, or getting owned by one or the other so that they can get around... Well, so VMware is maintained by Oracle, who is owned by Sun Microsystems. And they're the people that um, maintain Java. Right. So, Oracle, as far as the company goes, has kind of been bought out and merged all over the place. Yeah. It is... It is the daycare ditto of the world. Well, everybody's had a spin. <clears throat> yeah. Speaking of JavaScript, has all that stuff been worked out with them? I have not been keeping up with that. I yeah. do JavaScript, I do Java. Ja that's what I meant, JavaScript. Java, not JavaScript. Because for a while there, they kept saying, if you don't need Java, don't install it. Yeah. But for everyone who plays Minecraft, even occasionally. Well, so Minecraft has kind of been pushing towards more C Sharp and C++, but the original one was in Java. Do you still have and any of those original betas that you can no, throw up in one? No. I don't. Because I started in 2011. So. 
Anyway. I, I have no interest in maintaining old versions of Minecraft. <laughs> because not. there are people out there that have done that for me. Okay, yeah. Like, the, the Minecraft wiki, I believe, has and hosts all of them. And so you can go through the, all of them on your own, but... I started thinking beta 1.2.3. I joined an alpha. I joined when it was $5. Well, pre-alpha you got a free account, apparently. But that was way before. Yeah, that was very... You had to know Notch, basically. Yeah. But no, I started when Minecraft was $5. And wasn't released yet. I bought it in 2011, and it was funny, because the credit card company called me, and it's like, "Are you? did you make this? It's overseas. I'm like, yes, so I try it again. They buy. Eventually, I had to be like, can you just open right, this for 20 20- in euro. Yeah. That's right. No, I did it through PayPal. PayPal does the conversion. Well, I didn't have PayPal at the time. <laughs> PayPal's free. You should have always had PayPal. Well, I have it now, obviously. Yeah. I even have a PayPal credit card. That's exciting. Yeah. I haven't gone that far. Um, that's the show. Um, we've been an hour, five, however. So, like what you like, dislike what you dislike, I don't care. Anyway, thank you, and <laughs> subscribe. And we'll it's the s- notification is the new thing everybody's pushing. Eh, hit the, notification, hit the notification because I'm working on other channels because more like vehemently. I do have a very... A very neutral face. Well, it's pleasing to the eye. Neutral. Look how the light kind of reflects... It's a neutral face. Let's describe. It'll help you out. Enjoy. Bye.